Hello and welcome to the latest in this series of The Truth According to Interviews. Today I am joined by award-winning British journalist and newscaster Mark Austin. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this today Pleasure. with us, Mark. Pleasure. Um, I'm going to get stuck right in and ask you to start off by telling us about your early, early life and how you fell into this career path. Fell into it? Well, <laughs> I... Um well, I did, I, from the age of about 14, 15, I always wanted to be a reporter. And I think I was very lucky in that respect, that if you've decided what you want to do, it does make your life a lot easier. And so I um, started doing a few days' work whenever I could at the local newspaper when I was about 16. And um, then I did my A-levels and I got a two-week job on the local newspaper just after doing my A-levels. And uh, that two weeks became like six weeks and the six weeks became ten weeks. And then they said, well, look, what we'd like to do is to send you off and go on a course that you can do for reporters on a, a National Council for Training of Journalists. Mm. And so that's what I did. I went off for a year. Um, and when I came back, I got a job on that paper, the evening newspaper. And, um, and that's how it all started. And I did about a year, 18 months or two years working on the local newspaper. And working on local newspapers is a great training because you have to do everything. You do the crime calls, you do the courts, you do the council meetings. A lot of it really boring, but a lot of it great fun. And you really learn how to get a story and what a story is and how to use the story when you get it. And um, they were great days, great fun. And I ended up in London then on a, uh, an evening newspaper in London. And then um, got into the BBC uh, through the back door. Uh, a, lot, a lot of ITN and BBC, some of them go to and from. It's kind of great training for the both, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, to, I got in on a six-month contract at the BBC um, on um, their world service at Bush House. Nice. You know, this is London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was... Um, and it was just as a scriptwriter on their news programs. And it was all international news and foreign news and big international stories. And that's what really gave me a real um, inspiration to do foreign news. And I wanted then to, to be a foreign correspondent. And it was that uh, experience at Bush House, being surrounded by foreign correspondents who had come back to London and come into the newsroom and see everybody. And, and I thought this was just a wonderful life. Off they went, you know, and covered the world. And, and now I was a scriptwriter there. And then I went, got across to BBC Television News, eventually on a little succumbent thing. And, um, and I ended up as a, as I became a reporter at BBC Television News at the age of 22 or 23. Young. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be one of the youngest reporters on uh, BBC Television News. And, um, and that's what happened. And then eventually I came across to ITN. Um, when I was about 28, 27, 28, and, uh, and then became a sports correspondent and a foreign correspondent. Uh, loads of questions. Who, what, who would you say is your inspiration? What would have been your inspiration growing up, and has, how did it change over time? Do you have a new one now? Well, yeah, I mean, there was a guy called Brian Barron, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, who was a great BBC reporter. And uh, the first pieces I watched um, of his were in the Far East and he caught the end of the Vietnam War and um, the Cambodian War and he just had this job that I thought was fantastic. He was to spend his life in the most exotic places. Um, he had a great voice. He was a brilliant writer and I think Brian Barron and John Simpson at the BBC as well were real inspirations for me. Um, I just thought that this was the best job going. What a life to go to all the hot spots, you know, to witness history uh, unfolding. And um, I just was in awe of them um, when I started. And, um, you know, that I, I realized by watching what they did and the life they led that that's what I wanted to do. And if you could give any advice to someone today who wanted to get into this industry or get a job like yourself, what one thing would you tell them? Uh, be persistent and be lucky. Yeah. Um, it's much harder now. I mean, I, when I, you know, in the um, sort of early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, it was a lot easier because there weren't um, so many um, uh, youngsters 
on media training courses. Everybody seems now want to get into the media world. Um, you've got all these media courses at universities and colleges which are oversubscribed. So you've got all these people coming out all wanting jobs in the media. I mean, those days there were fewer people wanting to get into the media. Uh, there were fewer outlets as well. I mean, there was none of the sort of enormous number of channels that there are now. Um, but I was very lucky. I just got offered opportunities um, at the right time and I took them. And I think there's a lesson in that. I think that if you do get an opportunity, grab it with both hands and pursue it and, and make the most of it. It's just that sometimes I think people will get an opportunity and they don't realize at the time just how big an opportunity it is. And they maybe don't you know, make the most of it. Um, but I think the key, particularly for a journalist, you know, you've got to be persistent, you've got to be curious, you've got to be knocking doors down in your job. So just, you know, a, 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 adopt that attitude to get your job in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got to be, yeah, I think you've got to be thick skinned and I think you've got to be persistent. I think you've got to make a nuisance of yourself. Absolutely. But you've also got to have a bit of luck mm. and make the most of that luck when it, when it comes along. And what would you say is the hardest thing about working in the field? Well, I think the hardest thing working in the field in television news mm. is that quite often you will end up in dangerous places. And, um, and it's making decisions, I think, in those dangerous places, because you're not just making decisions for yourself. You're making decisions on behalf of three, four, five other people who may be with you, really? who may not have the same experience as you. And I think the, the responsibility that I feel, I mean, I'm an innate coward. My great protection is my cowardice. Uh, but, but, I read your answer. But, but, <laughs> but um, I, think, I think the biggest responsibility is particularly nowadays when there is so much danger out there and you know you what's been going on recently with journalists being kidnapped mm. and and then being killed um, you know that just highlights the dangers and how things have changed and how journalists are now targeted in so many ways and I think the great responsibility that I find is that when you've got other people around you it's making decisions on behalf of those people that you obviously hope are the right decisions, but staying safe. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's the hardest thing now. I mean, technology now enables you to do so much. You can go to so many different places. You could go to almost anywhere in the world and broadcast. Mm. Um, and we, 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 we went um, a few years ago to the Antarctic and set up a satellite dish and broadcast for a week in the Antarctic on doing a series on global warming. We went to the Zimbabwean border and just set up and we, you know, um, you can go to anywhere. But that itself has its great advantages, but it also has its, its, its disadvantages, which it, because you can do it, you do often do it. So you're pushing the barriers all the time. You're maybe getting into places that you wouldn't otherwise be getting into. And I think there's a, a lot of thinking needs to be done now, um, particularly, as I say, when you've got that responsibility for other people. Was there ever a time where you thought, I'm in danger? I, I don't know what to do. I, I need to get out of this. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, I mean, quite often you you make a decision early in the day to go somewhere because you've heard something's happened. So there's been an atrocity somewhere or there's been a, a, a battle somewhere so I'm covering Bosnia, for instance, mm. or um, um, in Afghanistan, all the different places. So you get up in the morning, you think that's where I'm going to go. This is the story I'm going to cover. And as the day unfolds and you make your way towards where you're going, you look for all sorts of different signs. You know, you look for the roads being incredibly quiet, nothing much going on. You're obviously warned occasionally that this has happened down there. So you come roadblocks and some roadblocks are very dangerous in themselves because the people might not want you there in the first place. So you're constantly making um, those sorts of judgments. And quite often we've, cameraman and myself, have decided that we don't like the feel of it and we've turned around and gone back. And on a, the odd occasion, you'll find the opposition, one of the, you know, the BBC or Sky or someone may have taken the risk and gone and got some great material. But you, you have to stand by your judgment on things like that, because if you, you know, if you sort of, you can push it too far. On many occasions, oh, I say many occasions, on, the, on the, a few occasions, we've also taken the decision to turn back 
and other journalists happen. I mean, this uh, happened, and I'm thinking of Sierra Leone now in, in Africa on one particular occasion, and two or three journalists were killed that going by driving down further down the road that we decided to turn back on. So these are very fine judgments, and you know, luck plays a part again. But yeah. Um, um, yeah, you do get caught in these situations. Um, one of the biggest stories, I think, well, in, in London and the, you have covered and you won an award for was the Lee, Lee Rigby murder. Um, I was just going to say what it was like handling a story like this and how was it? I think you were the, were you the first to show that footage. Well, how you came to the decision. it was, I didn't win the award, it was the programme that won. Yeah. yeah, no, but the programme won the award. And the, it, that was really all about judgment and what to use, what not to use, and what to do. Uh, in terms of telling the story of the consequences of that, of the implications of that, and the broader picture. But the real judgment on the day was had to be made about, you know, um, because this guy had walked over, if you remember, to someone holding up a mobile phone with his bloodied hands and the, 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 the weapon, and and he w it was a propaganda, almost like a propaganda video. Um, but we felt we felt that we had to use some of this because this was happening in broad daylight on the streets of London, came out of nowhere, and it was very quickly apparent that this was a, a terror attack, a terrorist attack of a very different sort. And so we did took the decision, um, senior editorial figures took the decision, and I think quite rightly, to show, to show that. It is in the public and, interest. And we decided that there was a public interest reason for doing it and you know notwithstanding the fact it was just a great story i mean an unbelievable story that this would happen and and um and yes and i think i think some brave decisions were made and and you know looking back the right decisions you've mentioned terror organizations there and another terror organization that you covered was the 9 11. you were in america for it were you yes yeah well we i, well, I was here, oh, you were here but, but you we were sent there. to america but that in itself was an extraordinary story because what the first thing the americans did was to close that close down american airspace and uh, quite a lot of canadian airspace was closed as well so we were sat i was basically living in a bedsit in near stansted airport for about three nights no. waiting for, a, for any flight to go and in the end we got out about two or three days later flew into montreal i think um or maybe Vancouver, I can't remember. We flew into Canada, drove across the border, had a long drive down into New York. And, uh, you know, so we, we actually got to the story like three or four days after it happened. But it was such a huge story, such a momentous event that, of course, we were covering it for, you know, two or three weeks after that. And um, it was just, you know, the most extraordinary story that, I will probably ever cover. What was it? I mean, even when I go, if I went to New York now, I mean, could be going to that site then, what was it like being there three or four days after? Well, I think there are, th you know, there are some stories and you have a very good idea of what you're going to see when you get there and you have, a, you've seen it before and you've, you know, and you're used to covering that kind of thing. The thing about 9-11 was just this extraordinary site that, that, that confronted you, that these buildings just completely leveled people still three days, four days later, walking around dazed and terrified and um, the firefighters going in day after day to try and get, you know, their own colleagues out, their friends, in some cases, their family out. Um, and just the, the, you know, the, the scale of it, you know, thousands of people dying from the, in, in these. Um, and I think it was just, you know, just the scale of what we're witnessing. And then, of course, you, the, the implications of it and what it's led to. You know, it's led to war in Afghanistan. It's led to war in Iraq. It's led to um, thousands of um, British troops spending years in Iraq. It's led to hundreds of British troops being killed. It's led to hundreds of American troops being killed. It's led to a war, arguably, if you trace it all through, that is still going on now. And, you know, so the implications of that one attack have just been extraordinary. Yeah.
I have two questions. The first is you mentioned um, you go to you go to these stories a lot, and you, you know you, you know that it's common ground, and you kind of get used to it. Do you, have you become hardened to these stories now, or does it ever become easier? Uh, no, I mean some stories just. Uh, I mean, the, um, I quite often get asked, "What is the most dreadful story you've ever cut?" And and it um, it's um, twenty years now this year since Rwanda. And I was Africa oh correspondent yeah. mm. um, in 1994, and I was sent to Rwanda. And I don't think I'll ever recover from what I saw there, I think. I mean, that was just one of the most awful places. And I mean, I went in a few days after the genocide, but just the bodies everywhere, the um, children lying in fields, having been mutilated with machetes and arms missing and legs missing and just the fear in the place and just the scale of the killing. Um, you know, five or six hundred thousand people being killed in the space of a few weeks. And just the general level of suffering and horror in that place was, was, was unbelievable. And it, and it was a year that had started. I mean, I was based in Southern Africa and it, the year began with one of the great events with Mandela being made president of, of South Africa. So there we are in April celebrating one of the, you know, great events of African history. First democratic elections, first vote for these people, 28 million people who never had a vote. And they were queuing up all day and night to vote. Mandela becoming president. A massive transformation of the country, first black president of the country, history in the making, a wonderful event. And then a month later, two months later, there was this just this most terrible thing going on in, in Rwanda. And um, I mean, I went back earlier this year and, you know, the scars just haven't begun to heal really even 20 years on I mean they're trying to do things like they're trying to put victims and perpetrators together in these villages and hope that this will lead to some sort of reconciliation and everything and they were all terribly nice to each other and everything but under the underlying um, feeling in that place is that it's going to take a very very long time for that country to recover and at the time, do, do you sh do you shut it out, or do you find a way of dealing with it? Well, I found it very difficult then because we had just um, my son was two, and my wife had just given birth as well to my to a second child. And when I went, it was just seeing so many children slaughtered and so many children lying injured in hospitals, and the, the hospitals that had no facilities at all to treat them, and that was. Yeah, I just found that all very difficult, having really young children myself as well. And I, and I, I, I normally uh, am able to sort of compartmentalise things. So, you know, you've, all right, I've been away, I've seen this, but that's in that, but I'm coming home now and I've got a life to lead and it, that's over there and it's fine. But I found that really difficult to do. And I, I as I say, I, you know, I, I think about that often. Mm. And I think it was just having young children as well and seeing so many children in a desperate state. And um, that's what I found so difficult. And then, of course, after the genocide, the um, Rwandan army came in and f oh, tens of thousands of people were forced out onto this sort of area of just basically volcanic rock. And they had to exist there with no water, no food, and it's like 5,000 people a day started dying from starvation and disease and cholera. And, and of course, to report on this as well, it's the only time I've ever been filming with a cameraman and people have been dying as you filmed. Normally they're either, you know, there's been a terrible tragedy and people have died or people are about to die because of but this was one here where you just didn't matter where you pointed the camera people would die so the whole thing the whole rwanda tragedy i found you know it was, it was very difficult to cover but but nothing obviously compared to the mm. you know the people who live there yeah um you, you mentioned mandela you got to meet him. <clears throat> yeah, several times. Yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. I mean, he was a very good man. I mean, he would. Um, I interviewed him in a studio. In a, my first interview with him, the first time I met him, was in a South African television studio, 
and we had to set up a bit like you know he we'd set up a chair for him and it was a chair for me and there were two ca cameras and sound men and everything and i was really nervous because i you know never met him before and he had just become president it was, it was before he was just before he was uh, the, the election and he walked in and he put his hand out and shook hands with everybody didn't almost just ignored me completely seeing that I was the journalist who was going to speak to him and he, and he shook hands with the sound man and the cameraman there was a floor manager and there were some other sort of technicians there and he went over and introduced himself and talked to them for ages and he just made everybody feel completely at, at home and just you know relaxed and then he came up and he said right you're the guy who's gonna you know give me a problem is that right and so we, we sat down and we just chatted away and he was charming you know and we did the interview and we took photograph and sign you know, I've got and, and a few weeks later I asked if I could go with him to Robin Island oh, yeah, okay. to see his his cell mm -hmm. in the prison on Robin Island and we didn't think he said yes so so off we went on the boat filming the boat. yeah and we went across and a few other journalists came and it was and he and I walked with him down the corridor of the prison into the cell and he talked about the cell and, how many people and, could and say that I was amazed it was a, it was amazing and and he was just so charming and so determined to um to, that the whites in South Africa would stay because he realized quite quickly that South Africa's future depended on the, the white population staying still being there because they ran the businesses and they ran the infrastructure and they ran you know had all this experience and he a lot of people in the ANC were saying oh no 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 this is the time for us and you know uh, retribution and all this and but Mandela was the one who really went out of his way to make sure there was reconciliation and make sure that the whites stayed and um, you know I, I honestly think that without him without that one individual I'm not sure that the South Africa transition would have happened in fact I am I'm sure that it wouldn't have happened in the way it did there is really no one else like him no I mean an extraordinary man I mean could you compare there's no one I could even compare him to today I don't think no who has done any such work no since. no it's very difficult to um to see it G given that he'd you know, he'd been in prison for 27 years. He wasn't so bitter, you know. That he came out yeah. without the bitterness, he without this peaceful, rancor. Probably. And that he was, you know, going out of his way and saying, no, this is not the way to do it. This is the way we're going to do it. And um, it was um, it was amazing. I'd love Absolutely. to have met him. Mm. Yeah. And um, something you also mentioned was your family. How hard is it to be away from your family when you're away and you're in this fighting? Well, for a lot of the time, I mean, when I was in Asia and in Africa, my all my kids were born abroad they were either born in oh, really? hong kong or they were born in south africa um and um so my family sort of traveled around with me so for 10 15 years i was living in in these places and you get really involved in the story but in your family there at the same time i mean in south africa it all got very dangerous the few months before the election there looked like it was going to be civil war and there was a lot of fighting in the townships mainly, but there was a lot of fighting, it was spreading and there were a lot of bomb explosions and the white right wingers were trying to, you know, get their own area of South Africa for themselves. And it, it was all falling apart. And I thought it was gonna be civil war. So I thought at one stage the family would have to leave. Mm. But, um, but no, it was, a, it was a great experience being there and living through these things and being able to do it with your family there and young kids. and. So yeah, so th so th and they quite like the fact that they were born somewhere else, you know, um, although all, all back here now. Yeah, I'd have liked, I think I'd have liked an upbringing like that. Um, something else you mentioned <coughs> about South Africa is obviously the ongoing trial with Oscar Pistorius. Yeah, it's just very interesting, isn't it? Just yeah, how yeah. I mean, everyone's watching it. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone has a judgment on it. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean everybody has their own view about yeah, it, of and you know, well, we've seen what's happened, but. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about it is, or one of the interesting things about it, is that the judge, there's no jury, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you have the judge sitting with two assessors, and this is a whole legacy of apartheid. And this was in, you know, the, the whole the jury system was done away with, largely because 
so many of the people were not edu under apartheid were not educated enough to sit on a jury and the, the, you know the, that it's a legacy of apartheid that this whole thing um, came up and they also thought that because of the way that apartheid created this tension between the races that they thought that you know the, the black jury would take it out on a white so it became a very difficult thing to have a jury system in South Africa so they ended up with this judge and two assessors and so because um, a lot of people find it very difficult to put, well, why isn't there a jury there? Mm. And of course, it's all a legacy of apartheid. I thought it was for reasons of corruption. I wasn't sure, actually. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's um, how, well, that was originally how it, yeah. um, it, uh, it happened. And the two assessors can overturn the verdict. If they didn't agree with the judge's verdict, they could overturn the, ver uh, the verdict. The two assessors could. But they can't. The sentence is just down to the judge, and that is obviously happening soon. So. It's, it's obviously being filmed. Um, do you think Britain could adopt, adopt that at any stage, uh, an open court that's being filmed, or do you think we'd, we should keep it closed? I would like, I'm, I'm personally in favour of more um, court hearings being filmed. Um, I think it's going to be a very slow process. It's going to be like trying to get cameras in the House of Commons was a very slow process, yeah. and even now it's very limited. And, um, but I'm personally, I'm in favour of, of more openness. It, if, look, if the public can go and sit in a court, then why not televise it? Because you can't get all the public into the, you know, Anyone seating. Wants, yeah. But if the if if you if you accept the premise that it's open to the public, then why not televise it? Is mm. my view. You're on Twitter. Yeah. How do you think the digital age has changed things? Well, it's changed it enormously. I mean, the job. <coughs> you know, I um, I went to a school the other day, and I was talking to some young students who wanted to be journalists and they were doing a, a sort of media work and they um, they wanted to do media studies at university and everything. so I was talking to a small group of them and I, we did a question and answer and one of the, my first questions they stood up and said don't you think that your media and your half hour news program at 10 o'clock at night is like outdated and <laughs> is passe and doesn't have a, a, a function anymore because we get all our news from our phones or we get our news from iPad or we get our news, you know. Um, the one place we don't get it is at 10 o'clock at night sitting in front of the television. <laughs> and, I th and, it, and they had a point because you do now get all this stuff. I mean, I'm on Twitter and I see it all. And Twitter at its best is very useful. You get some really interesting news feeds. You, so you know what's happening. You get really interesting links to blogs and you get great analysis and so you, at its best it's it's a real advantage and it's a great asset to to what we do at its worst it's awful i mean at its worst it's 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 just mush and noise and speculation and innuendo and rumor mm. and at worst downright downright lies so you can't trust Everything is on Twitter. And I think one of the problems, uh, my answer to this guy who stood up and said, aren't you, you know, isn't it all over for you? I said, well, it, you need trained journalists more than ever now because it's our job to sort of find a way through all this stuff and this noise and this everything that's going on and try and work out what is right, what is accurate, what deserves to be shown, you know, and sort of condense everything into a half hour news program at, at 10 o'clock, which still gets, you know, millions of people. So you, I, I, I don't think it, I think, I think if we use it properly, it's a great aid, it's a great tool for us, but I don't think it supplants us in any way. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's, the great skill now is to use, use both forms of media, mm -hmm. you know, new media and the more traditional media. Second screen. Yeah. Do you get mean tweets? Mean tweets. You ever see celebrities got, read mean I, tweets? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, like, I mean, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I read some of Piers Morgan, 8% of his tweets as abuse, <laughs> which I, I thought it'd be more than that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Piers Morgan. <laughs> but apparently 8% is abuse, but I would, I, yeah. I, get I don't abuse. know if you've ever seen James Blunt on Twitter, but he retweets his mean tweets. And Does he? Hilarious. Yeah. So funny, I'm going to reply to them. Is and he? He's uh, worth how many followers has he got? He's probably uh, millions. Oh, God, millions. Yeah. Yeah, but he gets a lot. Yeah. It's very funny. But you see, it's a real powerful tool now. Mm. So, you know, for instance, I don't know, 
um, Piers Morgan or something, you know, four million or something, four, five yeah, million. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. So he, you know, he his. I don't know what his program got on CNN, but it was certainly, you know, it was in the hundreds of thousands, because, you know, it's on. So he now has a, is able to reach four million people. And you've got these stars now who are able to reach 10 million, 15 million, 20 million, I, million I don't know how many, yeah. you know, Rihanna or million. someone yeah, like yeah. this. Or, and so they have a direct line of communication now to say what exactly what they want to say. So they, they, you know, they don't have to go and do press conferences or they don't have to do interview, so many interviews. They can say what they want to say on Twitter and they know it's going to get picked up and used so they can you know, post video. It's just changed the whole way that um, journalism works. Um, we have one more question for you, just for there's a couple of viewers' questions. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of your time as there well. There are a couple um, of viewers. That's good. The, yeah. We spoke about the lows, but about the highs. The Royal <coughs> Wedding. I still remember your coverage of it. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like such an amazing day to cover. Yeah. It, well, well, I wasn't going to do it actually, and then um, one of the editors said, "Look, just go down and have a, you know, see what you make of it all." And it, it, I got it all got just a little, you know, because they were drinking. You know, I was I got on the streets at like eight o'clock or nine o'clock, and I was just walking around, sort of doing a few little inserts into the program and everything. And all these people were drinking the like, champagne and vodka tonics and you know all this stuff was going on and they were, so I you know it was very difficult not to enter but it was very difficult not to enter the whole um, atmosphere it was just a great it was great fun and and then there was the moment when um, you know they they remove the barriers and all the crowds can come down to the palace and the, you know, the couple come onto the thing and you know kiss and whatever and uh, but they opened the barriers and I got I, absolutely engulfed. That's the, engulfed that's the point by of these yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were scouts putting stuff around and it. But it, and I got completely immersed in the whole thing, and it was all a bit of a pain. But it was it it was great fun. It was great fun, and it and it, actually it went mad on Twitter that, that that day. Actually, it was you know. So people quite liked it, obviously. But yeah. It was uh, it was a bit uncomfortable at times, <laughs> but not what I normally do. Yeah, 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 I yeah, think yeah. you know. Another fact, I was more worried on the mal actually than when he was in half the time. <laughs> so we're going to come down. It, it, was yeah. it was good fun. It was good fun. Yeah. I think we have a question. Yeah. From upstairs. Hello. <coughs> First question is from Joey Kelly. He says, or she, what advantages and disadvantages are there to independent news sources such as Truth Loader? To independent news sources. Well, against it, lighter news sources like ITV. So he means, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages to this versus yourselves? Well, I don't see it as advantage or disadvantage. I, I see it as, a, as an add-on, as an extra, as a great opportunity, and it's different, mm -hmm. and and it's easy to do, it's easy to use. I think if he's talking specifically about news sources, mm. I think there is a real issue about having to um, confirm and corroborate and just check out everything because mm -hmm. you know there's so many sources of news now and a lot of pictures are upload you know uploaded and you know, you don't know really what the where they're from who took it what the pictures actually show it, it, it it's a, it's a huge advantage in so many ways but you've got to be really careful about how you use those sort of sources and because they're not sources that you would mm. normally use and, they, and that's not to say because everybody's now a journalist in some ways I mean you know citizen journalism is a big thing so everybody's got their cameras and everybody is you know uh, can be the journalist for the day and but it, everybody also has their own agendas and um, people are well aware of the power of propaganda I mean you see it now and these dreadful videos that come out but the, so everybody has their agenda you've got to be aware of that as journalists and I think as long as you are smart and alert and you know you you wise up then I don't see the downside but I you know if you don't if you just go into it blindly and use anything that comes along then you're going to get yourself into terrible trouble yeah. and because at the end of the day for us being right and being accurate is is our 
trademark. I mean, without that, yeah. we really fall apart. It's all about our credibility. So we have to be Absolutely. very careful. And of course we make mistakes, and of course we get some things wrong and everything, but you, you know, you've got to admit that, move on. But the more these different sources are available to you, the more careful you've got to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do we have another question? Yeah. Kike Boo, <laughs> online name. Mm. Or maybe not. Can you talk about how you're prepared to go to dangerous places and what kind of equipment is brought with you? What do you bring? Well, it depends on where you're going, but um, quite often, I mean, the other thing to say, first thing to say, really, is that we all have to go through these courses. So you go on a course that um, teaches you first aid and also teaches you how to survive in a hostile environment. And they're often done in, the, in these sort of country houses in Hampshire and everything. And you spend a long weekend there with these guys, former SAS guys or former Marines who put you through the most terrible sort of events and, you know, incredibly realistic sort of kidnappings and things. It's terrifying, the whole thing. But So you have to go through all that and most staff who are deployed will go through that. So that's the first thing to say. And then, obviously, only people who are prepared to go, want to go, you know, you're not told you're going and that's it. You, if you, you know, volunteers go. Um, but you have, for instance, if you go to a war zone, I will take, um, we'll sometimes take food if we need food, if we know there's not going to be much food there. We'll take flak jackets, we will take helmets, we will take um, first aid kits and, and you know, and you just try and be as, as safe as you can. The, the, the difficulty is sometimes you just find yourself in the wrong place at the, mm. at, at the wrong time. And then, you know, heaven forbid, you just, you know, get out of it as best you can. Was there ever an assignment you said no to? You didn't want to do, or? Um, no, I didn't have to say no in the end because the trip was called off, but there was, we were talking about going into northern Syria at one stage a year or two ago to present a programme and just, and it was just at the time where it was getting really, because we, we didn't want to just do Damascus, we wanted to go into to the northern areas, into the, which was then oh, yeah. the, the, you know, um, the rebels and the free Syrian army, mm. and we were going to go and do something, but it was just becoming dangerous because of the different groups that were forming and these jihadist groups had started to form. And, and in the end, we just took a view that we weren't going to do that. And, and a lot of journalists, I think, have taken a view that that particular um, trip into northern Syria is, is too dangerous. Um, and we certainly made that decision. That call. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. But look, you know, you don't, you, there, are, there are journalists, there are correspondents who thrive on that kind of coverage and, you know, get, have this sort of adrenaline shot of, of war reporting. And they do it brilliantly, and we should thank them because who would do it if they didn't? And they expose things that are going on that we, we wouldn't otherwise know about. But um, um, I think you've just got to be really, you know, really careful. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> Keith wants to know what do you think of claims of Scotland voter fraud? What do you think of claims of Scotland's voter fraud? Well, look, I mean, I don't know the detail of it. I don't know much about it at all. Um, all I know was it was the most extraordinary time to be up mm -hmm. there. Um, and I've not really um, been involved in an atmosphere like it at, at an election time. I mean, I just think it was just an astonishing exercise in, in really passionate democracy. And I mean, I go to Scotland a lot. We spent... Uh, you know, I go to Scotland in the summer almost every year. Um, and the place was just transformed. It was just energised by it. And I just thought, and I just thought it was, you know, extraordinary to see all this, this happening and people becoming so involved and, and all the youngsters and the 16-year-olds voting. And I think, and I just hope it can in some ways, you know, re-energise people in other areas of politics. Yeah. And do you think David Cameron should apologise to the Queen? 
don't know if you heard the audio. Well, well, he, yeah, well, he was caught, cool, wasn't to, he? Yeah. He was absolutely bang, dead. Yeah. I mean, a cool, just, sort of bang to rights. What would you do in that situation? Bang to right. Well, I apologise. Yeah. I mean, bang to rights. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what but he was doing. There was a microphone walking at him. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he was doing, but then, you know. But um, you have to no, apologize, I yeah. think it could be one of the more interesting conversations. I think we should get to hear yeah, the conversation of yeah. the apology. Mm. I think that, that it should be televised. Yeah, I His think apology so too. should be. Yeah. That would be good telly. Um, we could do it on Truth Load. Question from Mickey. What do you think of the trend of major news organizations firing their investigative reporters? So basically, should there still be a need for investigative journalism? Yeah, well, we, I mean, uh, um, investigative journalism is incredibly expensive. Mm. But um, investigative journalism is also incredibly important. And I think, I, I'm really sad when I hear stories about the, the you know, that the organizations, news organizations now can't commit to these long investigations, because it is the long investigations that, that, that turn out to be the, the, the things that can in some ways change the way we do things and change society. And, and um, I think it's a great shame that, that and it's all about money, it's yeah. basically money. Um, but you see, when, when newspapers and TV companies do put the resources in, you see the results and you know, you, you see the, um, MPs' expenses, you see the tax uh, campaign, the investigation that was done in, by the Times. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not cheap. This is, you know, many reporters working over a long period of time just on that. So you can see why news organisations say we just haven't got the budget yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a great shame because I think what is the point of journalism if it is not to expose the things that people don't know about yeah. and to, to hold people to account? Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Well, but, and I'm equally, I'm equally yeah. sad that newspapers and other broadcast media are cutting back on, on foreign affairs as well, and foreign journalists, and mm. it just gets too expensive. I mean, we still have bureaus abroad at ITV News, and the BBC obviously does, but a lot of organisations are cutting back. A lot of newspapers are cutting back and using freelancers and using people who don't have the same protection in dangerous places as we do. Mm. And I think that is a real problem as well. In, modern journalism that you've got you know young guys who think they need to go to j dangerous place the only place they can go is dangerous places because other brokers get, yeah if they want to get them up known they want to get well known they want to make some money and i think there's a real issue about the way that mainstream news organizations are looking after freelancers who go and do this dangerous stuff yeah i think we've one more from toby if that's okay yeah How do you think the airstrikes will impact ISIS in Syria? Well, the, the, they will get a hammering, but mm. the, quest, the question is, um, I mean, I think it's like a dozen nations now who are going to be flying bombing raids on ISIS. The, the question is twofold. The question is, one, what can you bomb if they decide they're just going to immerse themselves in, in town, towns like Mosul or Raqqa, and once they sort of spread themselves into the community, very difficult to bomb them unless they come out and do stuff. So you'll control them, you'll restrict them, but the question too is what happens then? Mm. They'll, still there, they'll still be there, so you need to get, the real issue is not the bombing, which will happen and will have an effect. The real issue is whether you can get an army together on the ground that will fight the Iraqis or the Kurds or whoever that will fight together that will be well trained enough and well equipped enough to then go in and that's the big question. I mean, the easy thing is to, you, you know, it's a very easy war to fight a war from the air. Um, but the real question is who's going to do the fighting on the ground and who's going to win territory back and take back these cities? And that is, hasn't been answered satisfactorily. Yeah. So I think that's the big problem. Definitely. Um, I have one last question mm. to end it lightly. You won the Royal Television Society National Presenter of the Year this year. Yes. Beating Christian and Jon Snow. Yes. Does it get any better than that? No, no, it doesn't <laughs> get any better than beating Jon Snow. No, but I mean, um, it, I'm borrowing it from him actually because he always wins it. Oh, does Jon he? Snow. Yeah, I just kept. I think I've just borrowed it for a year, really. But Often. it was it was a real um, honour and a privilege to get that. It was really nice. Especially as. Sir Trevor Macdonald's successor as well. Well, it, well, I don't know about that, but he, yeah. it, um, you know, it's just nice to get something like that, and you, you know, you you go and you do your work, and you know, you go home, and you never think about, but 
it's just to be acknowledged like that. Absolutely. But so many others have, you know, I think I'm last to get one actually. No, you're not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, thank yeah. you very much to yeah. Mark today for, for agreeing to come in with us in studio. Um, we will be back next Tuesday with Jack Fresco, so you should be sure to stay tuned for that. Also, don't forget to check out the interview we had with Andy McNabb yesterday, so thanks for watching.